Welcome to another episode of the Justice Tech Pros Podcast. This is actually episode number 47. And we closing in, we actually hit the one year mark. I started the show November of last year. I don't remember the exact date, but we're right around there. So it's hard to believe that a year time has passed. And this is the 47th episode that I'm doing. Uh, time certainly does go quickly. And I'm happy to see that the subscriber base is increasing. Uh, we hit 9,000 this past week. And also on different platforms, we're getting a lot of views, a lot of downloads. So it's great to see that you know people are connecting. I'm happy to uh, realize that what I'm saying resonates with individuals and hopefully the public and those who weren't aware of certain things and certain aspects of the law that I talk about in the judicial system, maybe now they can uh, relate a little bit and it opens their mind a little bit and they uh, start to look at things from a different perspective or at least weigh the different topics that I bring up and the different areas that I look to focus on. They weigh that in their judgment. One could only hope that they, I'm connecting with future uh, jurors, current jurors, and the public overall. This way, you know, if you could if you could change how somebody looks at things or they at least understand the entire picture, because that's all I'm, I'm trying to convey with this podcast and with this platform, have people look at the whole picture just to understand what's taking place. So when they make a decision one way or another or form an opinion, they have all the facts and they understand what goes on behind the scenes, what plays out in front of their own eyes, what plays out in the media. And they, and they, you know, use all those different things to render a final determination or a final conclusion. And that's what I try to do here. I just try to give an alternative perspective, a little more of a hands-on approach and personal experience to have the listeners think about those things and mull them over and see if it makes sense or it doesn't make sense. And with that said, I, I want to obviously thank everyone for tuning in, uh, growing the channels, growing the downloads and the views. Uh, I greatly appreciate it to all the original listeners, to the new ones. I, I, I truly feel that, you know, what I'm trying to discuss here can do a little bit of good. And it, it's my part anyway to try to do that and to try to connect and to hopefully expand how an individual views certain topics that I discuss. Right before this, I was actually listening to uh, the Frank Morano show. He's on from 1 a.m. to 5 a.m. Uh, on 770 WABC. And uh, I, I just tell you that because I enjoy the show. Uh, you should just, if you go to like 770 WABC, I think it's WABCradio.com and you, you tune in if, you, if you're up late like I am sometimes and you want and you want to listen to something, it's a good show to catch. He, he was talking about the uh, current election, what's going on, and all of that uh, bedlam that's taking place. But that, that's that's his area to, to dive into. I try to stay away from politics. There's enough, enough chaos in the judicial system. I, I don't need any more. So I'm, I'm going to just focus on my chaotic world and things that, uh, that, that I can relate to and things that I experience. But anyway, with that said, today I wanted to... What, what I've been thinking about lately is I notice how... When I reflect back on uh, this past case that I was a part of with my father's case, one thing that they, they really tried to focus on, and to me it's a way of confusing the jurors, is when they bring in uh, informants or they bring in a witness to testify and to talk about you know the defendants, when there's lack of evidence on the current charges, what they'll have the informants do is they'll just try to paint a picture around somebody's supposed reputation meaning that they'll just try to focus on you know who they're supposed to be past conduct things that they're accused of doing in the past titles they're alleged to have but when you weed through that and you're trying to understand well how does that relate to the charges a lot of times especially in this last case, there was really no conduct discussed relating to the current charges. Most of it 
I would say 90% of it related to things of from the 70s, from the 80s, from the 90s, things that really weren't even charged under the indictment. So we're not getting into specifics. When you just think about that, because I, I want to keep it general so people could relate to it. When you just think about that on a conceptual level, and what I mean by that is if you just look at, if somebody's in front of you and they're being charged with crimes A, B, and C, one would think that everything on the trial and all the testimony given by informants or given by witnesses would relate to those crimes A, B, and C. However, if there's a lot, if there's lack of evidence or no evidence, what I notice they do is they'll shift it and they'll have the informants talk about totally unrelated items. And what that does is it paints a picture and not a good picture, obviously, you know, they'll try to talk about past crimes, things maybe they have, uh, the defendants have served time for prior, things that they were accused of, reputations, poor reputations they may have. Uh, anything that could influence and paint character of the individual, of the defendant. And yet it has nothing to do with the charged crime, but what that's doing is it's putting seeds in the juror's mind, it's planting seeds, that will grow when it comes time for deliberation. The jury will go back to those memories and go back to the testimony, and, and it will just have an impact where that individual will think, well, the defendant in front, of me, or in front of me is not a good person. They're guilty of something. They were guilty of this. You know, and that'll just play over and over in their head. And I'm, it's just human nature that's going to affect the decision-making process. And I touched on this in the past, how they could do that with the defendants. But yet, when the defense tries to go into the past or go into habits or go into actions that the informant may have done that is unrelated to the trial and unrelated to the defendant, right away a judge will stop it, the, the prosecution will object, and you're not allowed to really go down that road. And it truly is a double standard because when they'll go on and on, I mean these, you know, a lot of the times the informants will go on and on about unrelated charges, things that have nothing to do with the indictment. And that's what you're supposed to be faced with. If you're guilty of, let's say, robbing a bank, you want the entire focus to be on the evidence linking you to robbing that bank and not about something that may have occurred years prior that's totally unrelated. And by doing that, by introducing that and harping on that, you're tainting the jury's mind you're just painting an individual as guilty, not so much to the charges. You're just painting them as guilty. And I think that really blurs the line. And especially when you're dealing with cases where defendants are supposed to be members of an organization, uh, they, try to, they try to drill it into the mind of the jurors that if, they, if you believe this person's a member, then you have to find them guilty. And that's not how the law works. Just And I had an episode specifically on this. You know, just by supposedly being a member of some kind of organization, that's not illegal. They say that, and that's the law, but the way they paint it as the trial's going on, it's very hard for the public to grasp that. The way the trial plays out and the way they paint the defendants, I believe the jurors in their mind think, well, I do believe this individual may be a member of this organization, so therefore he's guilty. And that's once that's done, it's a very hard obstacle to overcome, and it's very hard to break that wall down. I feel once that's embedded in the juror's mind, they're just going to hold on to that. And when they're in that deliberation room, I don't know if they're going to really focus so much on the evidence of the charges. More so, they're going to focus on reputation, media headlines, what each individual who testified, the informants who were on the case, testified of a supposed position this person may hold. I think those are all the elements that are going to weigh heavily into the decision of either conviction or acquittal. And it's obviously done on purpose. Uh, the prosecution are intelligent uh, individuals. And they're using that, and they push that more and more 
when there is a case with lack of evidence, if uh, a defendant being charged has very little linkage to the crimes they're being accused of, and there's really no tie-in, they have to fall back on reputation, on past headlines, on accusations, on what somebody thinks uh, an individual may be, who somebody thinks an individual may be, things of that nature, just to paint this picture of having a sinister, dark atmosphere surround the defendant. So every time the juror looks at this person, that's all they revert back to. They revert back to these tales, they revert back to what supposedly happened in the 70s, in the 80s, in the 90s, and they lose sight of the fact they need to be focused on, okay, they're in front of me now. These are the charges. What ties this person to these charges? It almost becomes a sec an afterthought. And that's a big problem. But that's what, what plays out. And, you know, the more I, I think about and I relive or I replay out the the trial and how it took place, that was really a major focus and that was a major tactic. It wasn't so much it wasn't so much having testimony that related to what the defendants were being charged with, specifically where it related to my father. It had mostly to do with with these informants who 90% of them never even met him, but what they did testify to is what they read about him, what they heard about him, so it's about reputation. So now you're shifting gears from finding somebody guilty of the charged crimes to a reputation, to alleg allegations. And, you know, that, that's, a, that's a big, that's a big uh, issue. And I don't think the public, the jurors... And, and it's hard for them to pick up on that, but I don't think they grasp what is what is being done right in front of their eyes. You know, it's like a, a card game, a shell game, and they're moving the shells around and, and you're just trying to keep up with it. But all they keep going back to is, well, this defendant has this reputation, this defendant supposedly uh, a member of this organization, and they just pour it on and pour it on and paint it larger and larger and they harp on that aspect of it. And I believe that then plants the seed and it puts it in the juror's head. Well, I definitely believe this person's a member, so being I, I feel they're a member, I must find them guilty. And it's a huge obstacle to overcome, and I don't know how to change that. You know, I think the defense team would have to truly focus on that and really drill it into the heads of the jurors that even if you believe my client may be a member of a of this organization that does not make my client guilty. You need to focus on tying my client to the evidence which will prove his guilt or prove his innocence. Now, can you overcome it by doing that? I, I don't know. You would need a juror who is who is intelligent. You would need a juror who who is able to separate a personal belief or personal feelings, you know, if somebody just feels, you know, you, you have a lot of people who just feel that um, if you're a member of an organization, you're not a good person and you deserve to uh, be found guilty, whether you're guilty of the crime or not. Now, when you're dealing with that, you got a big problem. You, there's nothing you could do about that. But if you have an open-minded individual who's able to separate and a professional person who's able to separate personal feelings from what their responsible responsibility to law is, you have a shot. Which leads me to the appearance of a lot of these informants when they come in. I found it amusing because one informant, which sticks out in my mind because now working on the appeal process, we're doing a little bit of investigating and pulling some information, pulling some social media accounts. And the reason why I bring that up is there was a particular informant, his name was David Evangelista. When he was on the stand, and I spoke about him in an episode, so you could revert to that ex episode to really get an understanding of this person and the lies he told and uh, agenda and all that. But the point of today's episode is to focus more on the appearance part of it and how they 
which, you know, that's the move. I get it. They want to dress them up. They want them to look presentable. But it's funny in the sense that you have this person, that they'll be soft-spoken, uh, they'll act as if they're intimidated on the, on the stand, they'll act very quiet, they'll act composed. Yet, I was looking at this individual's past social media page. And, you know, I downloaded all the pictures, and it's funny because he has pictures of himself in a jail cell, which I don't know how he even pulled that off. He's in a jail cell. I didn't know you could be on Facebook while you're in jail. Now, I don't know if it was a halfway house or what, but it was a jail cell. And, of course, he has uh, tattoos, you know, all over the body. He's got two pistols on the side of his abdomen. And in the middle, I think it says step back or keep back, something along those lines. Just an intimidating uh, artwork, intimidating ink, putting on a totally different persona. So in my head, I was thinking... You know how a lot of times, not a lot of times, every time when they're doing a trial, uh, specifically an organized crime trial, they'll put up charts and they'll show all pictures of all alleged members of the organized crime of the uh, enterprise. They'll put up the charts. What I would like to do, what I, and I'm sure you wouldn't get permission to do it, and it just goes to show, once again, the double standard, but what I would want to do is make my own chart. I would get all the pictures of the informants on their social media. Anything they've ever posted where they're trying to look intimidating, where they're showing off guns, I mean, endless with a lot of these social media. Who's putting cash? Who's putting guns up? Who's putting drugs on the social media? I would just put the most intimidating pictures I could that they took to try to impress people with their shirt off, with the tattoos blaring. I would make my own chart. So every time that defendant, that informant, is testifying, I would put my chart up with his picture. And I'd want to see how the jury reacts to that. Because they'd be going back and forth trying to figure out if the guy who's talking is the exact same guy that's on my chart. And that's what they do with the defendants. You know, they make the chart. They have everybody's picture. Uh, If they have a mug shot, they'll put that. Anything they can to show to influence the jury and to affect the atmosphere in the courtroom and to draw focus from the what's taking place, the evidence at hand to the smoke and mirrors, I like to call it. You know, where they're showing the pictures, they're showing the chart, they're showing... I would like to try to do the same thing and see how that plays out. Imagine that, you have a chart, and on this chart, you have all the informants totally opposite of how they look on the stand. Who's got maybe a beard, a goatee, who's got earrings, who's got tattoos, who's got the shirt off, who's holding guns... All the most crazy pictures I could find, I would put that on my chart and leave my chart right next to it. I'd want to see how that would play out. You see how quick that wouldn't even be allowed. That's the funny part. That's the double standard. Why wouldn't a chart from the defense be allowed when you think about it? What's the problem with that? They're showing pictures. They're bringing in a supposed character of of the defendant. They're trying to say things they were accused of, what their true reputation is. Why can't the defense talk about the reputation of the informant? Why isn't the defense allowed to elaborate on the character of the individual that the jury is supposed to believe to convict somebody? That individual is supposed to be telling the truth. They're supposed to be giving a snapshot of what allegedly took place so the jurors can convict somebody. So why are you not allowed as the defense attorney, as the defense team, to use the exact same tactics? The prosecution uses pictures. Why can't the defense use pictures. Uh, to me, it doesn't make sense. And I know it would be objected to. I know it wouldn't be allowed. They, they would come up with some reason. But just common sense wise, general public, jurors, think about that. Do you really think that the person sitting in front of you testifying is the exact same person they were when they were on the street, when they were trying to make a name for themselves, when they were, you know, doing whatever they were doing to crime-wise, whatever they were doing, do you think that's the same individual that's now talking quietly, submissively, intimidated, uncomfortable? Do you think that's the same person? Do you think that's the persona they put out when they were on the street, when they were trying to intimidate people, when they were doing whatever they were supposedly doing? And all I'd want to do is just open up the minds of the jurors to that. I would just want to show them 
what's good for one side is good for the other side. So they're going to put up pictures of the defendant. They're going to show surveillance pictures. They're going to show all the pictures they want to show. They're going to show all these different charts. Here's our pictures. Here's our pictures of these informants. Here's what they really look like when they're hanging out. Whether, you know, here's the real person, not the one that's testifying in front of you. Here's the real person you're dealing with. And just weigh all that. The same way you get a, a, a whole gamut of pictures and a whole uh, array of different stories and reputation. I heard this and I heard that about the defendant. It should be allowed equally with the informants. And I could put together some, some chart with a lot of the pictures that I've come across, a lot of the pictures I found, even with the social media now and what they post. I would want to put up all of their posts, all, all of their Instagrams, all of their sayings, all, to show agendas, to show what they're up to, to show their end game. And now with social media, I mean, you see these informants getting more and more bold. You know, who's talking about book deals afterwards? Who's talking about why they became an informant, who has a, a grudge, an axe to grind, a good defense team will pick that apart. They'll explain that to the jury. They'll show, ladies and gentlemen, there was a motive to become an informant. It wasn't out of the goodness of their heart. They didn't decide to turn a new leaf. They, there's an agenda here. There's an agenda. And outside of not wanting to pay for their own sins, there's another agenda to make money, to make profit, yeah, you have to expose all that. You got to let the jury know about that. And the problem is, the defense team many times gets shot down when they try going down those routes. When they try to go down the route of really digging into who an informant is, so many times they get not only objected to where it's not allowed in, but even in the pre-trial motions when you want to Talk about bringing it in, you're just not allowed even before trial starts. You're told what you can and what you can't ask about. And it's it really limits the defense. And it handcuffs them in a big time way. It's hard to navigate that when you're not allowed to bring out certain things to expose somebody's character. It's very hard to navigate that. That's an art. That's why there's great attorneys out there because they're they're artists. They know how to they know how to navigate that. They know how, how to extract it. But one would figure it shouldn't be that hard to do. You know, one would figure that you would be allowed to put up your best defense the same way the prosecution pretty much has no limitations as far as going into past acts of a defendant, as far as talking about supposed reputations, as far as talking about all the media hoopla about somebody or what's supposedly somebody, a supposed position somebody holds. There's no holds barred. But with informants, it's very, very narrow. That path that you could go down is very narrow, and it's hard to discredit somebody when you can't really dive into their character and expose who they are as a person. You can't even put up pictures of them. As I was saying, you can't even put up who they really are, who they were putting out on social media for all these years, who, you know, how they were trying to portray themselves for all these years. You can't even dive into that. And it truly is a, du a double standard. Speaking of double standards, recently it's been in the New York news, there was an informant who was on a podcast, another informant's podcast. I spoke about this in the past, how all these informants now have podcasts. But this one individual appeared on a podcast that was hosted by, I guess, their ex-felons in addition to being informants. And with that said, part of usually the conditions of supervised release or probation, you're not allowed to interact with a felon without getting approval. So apparently this guy didn't get approval, and a judge happened to, it was brought to his attention, I don't know if he just happened to hear it, or somebody heard it and told him about it, but the judge who dealt with this informant when the individual was, I guess, testifying against people. The judge heard the podcast and wasn't happy about it. He wanted to see if the uh, informant got it, permission to be on the podcast. Apparently, he didn't. So the judge obviously took, took uh, issue with that. 
and he wants to find out why he did that. It's a it's a violation, and I guess that you know that's playing out. But the reason why I bring that up is one thing that stuck in my mind is I was reading on the docket the government's recommendation letter about the in regards to the informant violating his supervised release or violating his parole. They recommended no uh, jail time. And it was supervised release, I believe. But they recommended no jail time for this violation. And you want to talk about double standards. I, I've experienced that with defendants having conversations with having a lunch, you know, not going on podcasts and talking about crimes for, you know, an hour, but going and grabbing lunch with somebody who was a felon that they may not even know that the person was a felon and they got violated. And not only did they get hit with time, they got hit with serious time. They got hit with, you know, time that actually matched the original crime that they did time for. So if they got nine months, they got hit with an additional nine months for going to lunch with somebody, going to dinner with somebody. And, I, you know, I remember reading that letter by the government, and the, and the letter did not say we don't recommend any jail time, just additional supervised release, which I believe that's what they recommended for the informant, just additional supervised release time. That's not what those letters say when it's a defendant. Those letters from the government say, we want jail time, put him away again. And obviously, I understand. I'm not. I'm not ignorant. I understand that they work for Team America. You know, the informants on Team America, and they're going to try to protect their own. But for the general public, they should just realize the double standard in that. Why should somebody? Shouldn't the same laws apply to anybody who breaks the law? It shouldn't be catered based on what if any way a person helped out the government. Okay, you helped out the government, but now you made a deal. You should stick to the deal. Or you're just saying, well, you can make a deal, you can break it whenever you want, and there's no consequences. I just think the public needs to see the accountability aspect of it. And they just need to understand the double standard and how things work. If you just look at the picture as far as the facts and take out what somebody did and what somebody didn't do. You don't factor in whether somebody's an informant, you don't factor that in, you just look at the facts. This person broke their supervised release... Normally, the government will send a letter requesting jail time. However, in this case, they didn't. You have to ask yourself, well, why is that? We all know the answer, obviously. You know, they helped out the government. They're going to weigh that. My point just is, I believe the public should understand that the law should be the same way regardless of title, regardless of what somebody did, regardless of alleged position, regardless of who somebody supposedly is, regardless of crimes, the law should just be the same way. And I'm not saying like that is a theory, like that's the way it should be. I wish it was like that. That's the way it's written. I talk about it all the time about Lady Justice being blind and all that. I, I harp on that. And that's really the point I'm just trying to make. She's not blind at all because if she was blind, none of these things would matter. The person that is an informant, it wouldn't matter that they're an informant, be an informant because Lady Justice is blind. So if they broke the law, whatever the penalty is for that would have to play out because it's blind. Nothing else would matter. But that's not how things play out. And I guess... That's where I always come back to where I just question, how does the public not see these things? How does jurors not understand these things? What are they missing? I try to look at uh, various instances and situations from an outside perspective. And it's not always easy to do because you are personally vested sometimes. But if you remove that, and you try to analyze a situation, not factoring feelings, not factoring your moral code, your moral beliefs, or your moral system, and you just try to analyze the situation on a factual basis, when you look at these things, they don't really make sense. Logically, they don't make sense, and they don't play out according to the law. And it's concerning that jurors aren't able to do that. 
I think when you sign up to be a juror, you have to do that. You can't use the excuse of belief system or your morals. or You have to put that on hold. That's your responsibility when you sign up to be a juror. And I don't think that's explained well enough. I really don't. And the jury instructions, they don't really go into that. They don't go into the responsibility. They don't go into what they should be looking at. It's more focused on the charges and how they should apply the charges. Very extensive instructions as it relates to the case, which I spoke about in another episode, whereas jurors could get lost because sometimes the instructions are so overwhelming and so detailed, you lose track of what's up and what's down. But what's disturbing to me is, as a juror, they're not taking the time to look at the whole picture. They're not taking the time to see the double standard. They're not taking the time to understand rules are not being applied equally. And the game that's being played in a legal sense is not being played fairly. And lately, justice has been at the forefront. As we're all aware, there's a lot going on in the country. There's a lot of different groups, different organizations fighting for justice and fighting for equality. But what gets left out a lot, in the grand scheme of it, people aren't focusing on the little things, what takes place in a courtroom. They're focusing on the, the, the large grand scale things of being uh, racially profiled, which are all huge, huge problems. Don't misunderstand me at all. What I'm saying is I think it, it goes deeper than that. I think the public needs to focus on the small little details as well, how things do play out in the courtroom. The different tools that a prosecutor is allowed to use versus what a defense team is allowed to use. What the prosecutor is allowed to argue versus what the defense is allowed to argue. How deep the prosecution could go on a defendant as opposed to how deep a defense attorney could go on an informant. Those things really need to be looked at. The whole subject of discovery, which I've spoken about as well, which has gotten a lot of, made a lot of positive headway in New York and different states, but needs to be done on a federal level. I think all those individual details really need to be focused on. If a change is going to be made and people are going to start receiving a fair trial based on the facts, because I've said from my first episode, and I'll say till now on the 47th episode, That's really my focus, regardless of personal beliefs, regardless of personal feelings, regardless of my moral compass, that's all irrelevant. I don't put that on anybody. I don't want any listeners to think like me, to view things the way I view things. That's not why I'm here. That's not why I'm trying to connect. I'm just trying to explain, and I want the public to understand, when at the most simplistic level, The most elementary level, the legal system needs to be blind. The justice system needs to be blind when it comes to a defendant in the courtroom. They need to give that person a fair shot. They need to give that person a clean slate to fight their case. They need to make certain that innocent to proven guilty is in their mind when they're serving on that juror. When they're on that jury panel, they need to make sure, you know, how do we do that? That's that's the problem. And that's something I don't have the answer for. This is my small part of trying to do that. And what I'm trying to do is just explain things and rationalize and give explanations, give details, give perspective to hopefully have a juror who gets selected Maybe an episode pops in their head and they say, you know what, I remember that. And I remember that the defense isn't allowed to go deep on this informant that's in front of me. What has this person done? What is their angle? What's their agenda? What's their motive? And hopefully those things will all play play a part in the decision-making process. And I always say, unfortunately, you know, my show doesn't a- a- appeal. I do not appeal to people who are closed-minded, and there's a lot of those. There's a lot of people who feel 
If somebody's accused or, or holds an alleged position or somebody's a, a gang member or somebody's part, part of some kind of association or somebody is accused of a, of a crime that they don't agree with, they don't even want to hear the facts. In their mind, they, they have that person guilty and the way they look at it, the ends justify the means. If they're not guilty of this, they're guilty of something. I'm not appealing to those closed-minded individuals. Those are ignorant people. And unfortunately, there's nothing you could do about that. And if you get those on your jury, you got a big problem. That's just the way it goes. I have no delusions about that. I do not think in the slightest anything I say would appeal to someone like that. I don't even try. Hopefully, they don't even listen. This way, they don't waste my time. They don't waste their time. My focus has and always is trying to connect with somebody who may be not aware of certain things and is open to hear another side of it. And that's who I try to appeal to and that's who I try to connect with and that's what I'm hoping will change. Maybe it'll change the outcome for a future defendant, somebody who's innocent, but doesn't have that great of a reputation. Maybe somebody had a bad past and they're trying to do things differently and they don't want that past haunting them, but yet that's what they're up against when they get indicted. They're not guilty of the charges, they're guilty of having a past, and that's what the prosecution's trying to find them guilty on once again. And hopefully, maybe a juror will realize how the system works, and you can't find somebody guilty of past actions, or reputation, or persona. You have to find them guilty of the charges. That's the focus, the charges. Connect the charges with the evidence at hand, and then if after that you find them guilty, that's the way the system works. But at least you gave them a fair shot and you're not finding them guilty based on something that's completely irrelevant to the charge, to the case, to any of that. Now, I will say one positive thing of all these social media posts and podcasts and all that that informants are putting together, defense teams are taking notice, downloading episodes, putting together snippets, putting together statements that are made putting together posts that are made, comments. What I notice that happens a lot is a lot of these informants will go on the on the episodes and they'll comment a lot. You have to take snapshots of all that. Take all that. Build a database. I spoke about this database many times. Take all of that. That's very important. That could help a defendant in the future. You could show what that informant's up to, what their agenda is, what their motive is. Make sure you you know you have all that in your defense team's bank. Make sure your defense team, somebody's on that. Because there's a lot of important stuff on that. There's a lot of important information. There's a lot of things that could help. It could help appeals. It could help cases. When you see agendas, you see motives. And just keep quiet about it. Just download it. Use it. Build it. But there's a lot going on. Keep an eye on that. See who's commenting. See what comments they're making. If they're appearing on shows, download the episode, analyze the episode. It's all very important for a defense team. And I hope, I know several are because I've spoken with them, but I hope a lot of defense attorneys are taking notice of that and building that database. It will prove to be very important and very helpful. So that's my advice on all of, all of that and all of what you're seeing on that. It's like putting pieces of a puzzle together. Sometimes you have to follow these comments and you'll be able to see, because obviously they use different names, you know, different uh, platforms, uh, YouTube or Instagram or Twitter, they'll have different names, different handles. But you could connect the dots and you could put that together. They'll have their own YouTube channel sometimes under a different name, talking about different topics. And you have to, if you follow that, and you're on top of that, you could find a lot of helpful informa- helpful information. As I said, for an appeal, for an upcoming trial, you could use a lot of that. So it's very important that your team, whoever's doing the investigating aspect of it, has a handle on that and is able to follow those things because you can get a lot of helpful information. And it'll also help building a defense when you could put all that together and you could show that a lot of the steps taken by these different informants, they all pretty much follow the same formula. 
They all have the same motives behind their reasoning. They want to commit all these crimes. They want to do all these things, you know, until uh, until the cuffs get slapped on. Then they're reborn again. But you just have to show they all take the same path afterwards. Looking for book deals, movie deals, publicity, fame, whatever it may be. If you lay it out properly, it's going to make a strong statement to any juror. Any hardworking juror who's getting up in the morning, working every day, breaking their ass in plain, plain English, and you're going to start showing them individuals who just got jammed up in one scam and decided to create the other. And what's the other scam? Becoming famous on stories, on tales, and whatever else. Getting book deals and whatever else, blogs, whatever else they got going on. And you show that and you, you exploit that and you bring that to light, I think it's going to have a powerful, powerful impact on an informant's testimony. And I think it'll really show the jurors what's at play. That it's not always whatever's coming out their mouth is gospel. That there's a lot more to it. And that's really what you want. You just want the jurors to think about it and to understand that what's playing out in front of them isn't always a reality. And what they're hearing isn't always truthful. And although people may want to say they're turning over a new leaf or whatever the coming to Jesus moment they had, the truth is it's much more, much more easier to understand the fact that Basically, they got caught. They didn't want to do the time. This was a get-out-of-jail-free card. That's the route they took. And now they're going to capitalize on it. You lay that out for a jury, it's going to do a lot of good. And on different levels, as I said, there's a lot of ways of using the, that information. On the defense team level, on an appellate level, there's a lot of ways of building that. A defense team on a whole has to really get it in their head. You're not playing on a level playing field. Everything is tilted significantly, so you have to do whatever you can to climb that hill and put the edge a little bit on your side, give you a little bit of a boost. So you have to do things unorthodox. You have to think outside the box. You have to really become an independent thinker in the sense that where somebody will feel it's a waste of time, do it anyway. Put it together. It can't hurt. Whatever you find, scratch together and build it. And then put it out for the whole defense team to analyze it and see what could help and what can't help. And if you have other lawyers working together, everybody contribute, you know, you can make something really impactful. Something that really builds a solid defense. Something that really affects the outcome of an appeal. Because it's not one thing, not two things, not three. You keep piling it on. You have to show a pattern. You have to show what takes place. You have to show inconsistencies. A lot of times, which is big, after the fact, after the trial, you'll see things said by certain informants that prove an inconsistency. You got to pay attention to that. Pull those trial minutes. See if they say that their rationale for turning informant is the same rationale they're now promoting on social media or the comments they're using on social media. See if that ties in together or see if it's completely opposite. Then you can use that. You know, those are all things that the uh, defense team need to be in tune with and focus on and work, work with one another on. And I believe the key is just making sure the defense on a whole works in unison. Because you're up against, which I've said time and again, a very strong opponent. You have an opponent with endless resources, endless money, and endless time. There's nothing more powerful than that. You're not going to match it. All you could do is outwork it the best you can. The only way to outwork it is nonstop. Keep pulling things. Dig where they won't think you're going to dig. Look where they don't think you're going to look. Pull things that they don't think you'd ever pull, you'd ever come across. And that's how you try to counteract that. And that's how you try to fight that. And that's pretty much it for today. I think we uh, 
I think I exhausted the analysis on that. I think I made my point clear. I, I do like my idea about um, showing showing my own chart with all social media pictures. I'm sure the defense attorneys thinks I'm out of my mind because they know that I'll never get that I'll never get approved and that I'll never fly. And trust me, I'm very grounded with that. I know what would get approved and what would fly. But my point in bringing a lot of these things out is I wanted to show the public. I want them to think about, well, why can't you do something like that? And then when it doesn't happen, they should really think about that. Well, why don't I see, why don't I see the other end of that? Why don't I see these other pictures? That's really why I talk about it. No part of me thinks it's ever going to get approved. I know a lot of times it can't play out. But I say it to make a point. I try to paint a picture so people could think about it. I try to relate in a common sense way. And I feel that's been the driving force of the show. And I feel that's why the show's been successful. And what I mean by successful is people are listening. Regardless of how many it's listening. It's more, I'm connecting to more people than I did prior to November. So to me, it's a win. Regardless of the numbers, the numbers are not that important to me. Obviously, the more, the better. That's great because more people are listening. And that's the whole goal of it, just having more people listen. But as long as I keep connecting, people are relating to it and judged by the emails, by the calls I'm getting, people are relating to it, by the numbers going up. I think this is doing something positive and getting people to think and hopefully getting jurors to think and also hopefully helping defendants. Defendants could listen to this and give their attorneys some ideas. And as always, keep the emails coming, the calls coming. I appreciate them. I'm glad everybody enjoying what I'm putting out. Until next time.